Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the AVPN September webinar on building Myanmar's pipeline of tech ventures and social enterprises. My name is Emily, and I'm the AVPN's representative in Myanmar. Um, as most of you on this webinar will be aware, we are a funders network committed to building a high impact social investment community across Asia. And currently we have over 500 members across 33 countries. And we're very pleased to have two of our members based in Myanmar speaking today. Representing One to Watch, we have Robert Groenen. And representing Pandiar, we have Jess Kalibe peterson And different from some of the previous webinars, Robert and Jess will not be delivering a presentation, but we will be taking you through a couple of topics by means of a conversation amongst the three of us. Before we proceed, I would like to note that we will not take any questions from attendees during the presentation but we will open the floor for Q&A afterwards. Please feel free to use the screen to type in your questions during the webinar, and I will raise these questions to Robert and Jess at the end. Also, if you have further questions that are not answered by the end of the webinar, you can email us at membership at avpn.asia. Okay, let's get started. Jess, Robert, could you first please introduce your organizations? Let's start with Jess. Thanks, Emily. Uh, thanks very much for, for, for having me here today on this webinar. Um, I'm the CEO of an organization, Pandiar, and located in uh, downtown Yangon. Uh, Pandiar means a uh, place, and we are a community hub. Um, our mission is to accelerate in Myanmar using technology, and we do this in major ways. As you see in this, we have a program called Accelerate, which is all about helping grow the tech and startup ecosystem. And we have a program called Social Impact MM, but supporting change agents in uh, creating change using uh, technology. Uh, if you go to the next slide, we'll look a little bit at our work in the Accelerate program, which is obviously what we're going to, the kind of work we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, we have, over the last four years, since we launched NDR, uh, built out a entrepreneurial uh, fund or Journey, if you will, that focuses on uh, delivering value across stages of, um, of the startup journey. So at the ideation and inspiration stage, we do a bunch of events um, to get aspiring entrepreneurs um, excited around the opportunity of starting a business and the basic inspiration that it takes to, uh, to commit to, to launch a business. The next stage, we work on developing skills, helping people validate businesses. Uh, so that they are well equipped to, to launch their business when they decide to do so. Um, then we have a program called the Pandy Accelerator, which is sort of a flagship uh, uh, position in terms of how we help startups. In the Accelerator, we uh, invest a little bit of money in all startups that go through the program. We offer office space, coaching, and mentoring, and so on over the six months. And the goal for the startups in the Accelerator is um, that they um, these two major KPIs. Um, one is the real traction for revenue and customers, and one they get ready to raise the next funding. And that's the last stage of our entrepreneurial journey that we work with, where we support the startups in getting their full-on round of funding from investors, typically in, in Myanmar and the region. And and, um, and 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 then they're on their own. <laughs> and that's sort of how we uh, sort of how how we how we, we try to add value to the startup ecosystem here in Myanmar. If you go to the next slide. We'll take a quick look at, at, at some of our numbers. Um, can, we, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, thank you. So I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but uh, since we launched the Accelerator program in 2016, uh, we've reviewed uh, more than 130 startups for the Accelerator. We've done due diligence in about 50, and we've made um, 11 investments in the, in the Accelerator startups. Um, 
we, uh, we've, we've, we've also built out an extensive network of mentors and investors um, and strategic partners who in some way or the other provide resources and support to the, to the startups and the entrepreneurs in our network. Um, so that's really briefly uh, what we do at Pandiar, um, and I'm really looking forward to digging into some of this uh, as we talk today. Thanks, Jess. Robert, do you want to introduce One to Watch and Rockstart? Um, yes, uh, Emily, thank you for having us as well. Um, One to Watch connect uh, impact investors from all over the world to Burmese and Nepali entrepreneurs. Um, and in order to do this, we uh, source investors um, internationally and locally um, and entrepreneurs in uh, Myanmar and Nepal. Um, we educate investors about opportunities to invest um, and develop the pipeline of investable entrepreneurs. Um, to develop the pipeline, we run yearly uh, one sort of flagship accelerator that's called Rockstar Impact um, in Myanmar uh, Enterprise in Nepal. Um, and we run several free accelerator uh, programs to get entrepreneurs ready to, to that stage. Um, as you can see on, on the slide as well, we focus um, in sector terms. We're quite sector agnostic, but we mainly focus on agro businesses, um, usually value added services, um, infrastructure, which is a lot in clean energy and, uh, and, and microgrids and related services, uh, and in healthcare. Um, we focus, for example, on superstition of in, uh, imported products, exporting, mainly in, in of niche uh, products, and all companies have some kind of technology edge to it that, that help them uh, to scale um, uh, or make them more efficient. Um, yeah, and I said that the, the service that we actually deliver is the two accelerator programs that we run since 2014, um, the deal making and investment management services. We have now uh, 4.5 million euros under uh, management in 15 uh, companies um, and we um, deliver post-investment business development support to, to companies as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so on the next slide here, you see an overview of what we plan to cover in, in the coming 40 minutes. Um, we will have, or we will start with a bit of an introduction more generally to Myanmar as an investment destination today, we wanted to talk about um, the landscape um, in terms of tech ventures and social enterprises, on expanding the pipeline, what's being done, um, what can be done, and more specifically, uh, the value proposition of investing in Myanmar and what to expect. So to start with the first one, um, so investing in, in frontier markets is, is never easy um, and in, in the past years in Myanmar, we've also seen incredible growth and opportunity, but also stumbling moments. Where do you see us today? Robert, do you want to start with that? Um, yes. Um, um, so as you, you uh, probably all have seen, uh, Myanmar has seen several conflicts over the, over the past year and also the years before. Um, the, some effects that, uh, that we've seen from that here on the ground is that foreign entities, both businesses and investors, uh, are reluctant to enter the market. Um, either they put less focus um, on, um, on, on uh, increasing their, their activities, scaling up their activities here in Myanmar, uh, or they might stop uh, activities com uh, completely. Um, Tourism is, uh, is down. Uh, the Made in Myanmar label uh, needs some explanation as, uh, at this point, which might um, put a strain on, on the development currently. And you, you feel these effects on the ground uh, as well. Um, simultaneously, on the other side, you see that the policy framework surrounding uh, investment and doing business in Myanmar is uh, gradually, slowly but surely improving which gives more opportunities for foreign investments in, in local companies. Um, and all the opportunities that were very clear two years ago still exist. Um, and then you can think about an economy that is at least five times smaller than similarly looking uh, neighboring countries, such as Thailand, Malaysia, or, or China. Um, maybe Myanmar is a very favorable trade location uh, 
promising uh, harbor and incredible opportunities in agriculture, energy and education. Um, and at the same time, taking up um, opportunities in these sectors might be relatively straightforward in the sense that the technology and the knowledge on how to uh, improve these value-added services or the technologies that are necessary do already exist. The models are known uh, abroad or sometimes in the country, they just need to be implemented. So um, the political future is obviously hard to predict or to influence uh, for, for parties like ours or for investors in general. But it's possible to work actively with those Burmese who are eager to solve these uh, challenges and, problem, and problems using scalable businesses. And, I, and uh, we strongly believe that that is the way forward and that these opportunities uh, very much exist. Um, and we also believe that um, uh, scaling up these businesses and growing a bigger private sector um, uh, and a more developed education sector that it will also help the country facing uh, in their facing of political uh, problems. And the last point that I would like to make is that since Myanmar is so much in the news, um, even though it's uh, for the wrong reasons currently, um, this might actually in the long run be a benefit since the entire world gets to know Myanmar. So as soon as Myanmar turns from being uh, sort of, so to say, the bad guy into more or less the victim that is rising up from, from the past, this might actually um, be beneficial to it. Jess, how, how do you see this Myanmar as an investment destination today? Yeah, well, I, I think Emily, I, I think you're absolutely right when you say that. You know, you mentioned that, that we, we perhaps stumbled a bit recently, right? I think you're absolutely right that there, there certainly was a sense, and definitely in the tech space, which is what we at Pandora is focused on, right? There was a sense a few years ago that. Uh, oh my God! There's going to be so much stuff happening in Myanmar because we had the elections and we had the whole, the whole digital leapfrog. Where suddenly everybody started going online and everybody's bought smartphones now. And that's really that's really amazing, of course. Um, but I also think there's a sense now that uh, people feel <laughs> what happened for all the optimism that we saw three years ago, right? And I think there's there's several factors at play here. One of them is that um, when this whole digital um, digital, digital leapfrog, digital push started really, really taking on. Um, there was a first wave of uh, of new businesses that emerged um, that used technology, but that were largely targeting um, an urban population of, of middle and upper middle class uh, consumers. Uh, many of them have raised money, uh, both um, both locally and internationally. Many of them have done well, but it's also important to keep in mind that those businesses, many of those businesses in the first wave, they target a relatively small portion of the population and markets that that, that were and, and or aren't that developed yet. Now, if we look at the, gen the new generation of digital consumers, the folks that have bought the first smartphone within the last one or two years, and the folks that are just getting online now, that's the majority of the population. That's and it, I, it's important to keep in mind that I know many of our listeners are, are, are in Myanmar, but, but many uh, may not be. In, Myanmar is a country of 55 million people, and um, and most of these people have just now gotten online. And so, in terms of looking at the tech proposition, you know, I think there is going to be um, there's going to be a, 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 a bit of time, maybe maybe a few years, maybe several years, um, before we start to see this new cohort of consumers. Um, Really, um, really catching on. That, that that might be one of the factors that are contributing contributing to this um, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial slump um, that we see um, that we see at the moment. I think in general, you know, there's a very strong entrepreneurial spirit in Myanmar, much like in, in many other Asian countries, of course. Um, and some of the folks that we work with here, there's there's a lot of passion, a lot of energy. Um, but it's also really important that there are uh, leaders in this space that become beacons. Uh, for the community, folks and businesses that 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 aspiring entrepreneurs can look up to, um, that are sort of showing the way in terms of what does what does success as an entrepreneur or as a startup business in Myanmar look like, and um, we have a few of those, um, but it's really important that we keep developing new leaders in order to encourage more and more people to take some risk, uh, both in terms of the local entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, but also in terms of uh, getting more uh, investors and ecosystem builders from the region to commit to Myanmar. 
Yeah, so if we if we look at that in a bit more detail, I mean, both of you work with a lot of entrepreneurs. You you see, you receive a lot of entrepreneurs' businesses um, in your spaces through your programs all the time. What sort of promising entrepreneurs do you really see um, in the tech space, in the social enterprise space? What sort of sectors, what sort of geographic areas? Um, yeah, where, where are things really moving and where might things be moving more slowly? Jess, do you want to start? Um, sure, yeah. So um, I think what, what's really interesting, I think, around technology is that um, five to ten years ago, um, the technology landscape was, was almost non-existent in Myanmar. And so um, almost no matter which sector you look at, um, you will identify opportunities where technology can, has, can have an impact. And that's also why when we look at startups and entrepreneurs that are launching new tech businesses, even though they didn't set out purposely with a social impact aim, uh, they would almost by default still um, be, be able to, um, to, 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 to have a, a to, to, to influence uh, and, and, and create social impact through what they do. And so at Panera, we, we support we support tech businesses in any sector, right? Um, a few a few really interesting examples that we've worked with are in the um, employment space. Um, one of the one of the startups from our first cohort, uh, Chatesat, is a freelancer marketplace um, where small businesses or any businesses really can find freelancers to design a website for them or do some translation work or whatnot. And freelancers, people all over Myanmar who have skills. Um, that are that are applicable to, to to general business needs can find can find extra work and, and in some cases actually make a full time job out of it. Um, Chase uh, is founded by two sisters who were part of some of the hackathons that we did at Pandiars several years ago, and then got this idea to start their business and they quit their jobs and they got into the accelerator and uh, they went on to raise more money from investors uh, both from Myanmar and from from around the region. And they've just closed their, their they've just closed the third round of funding now. Um, so I think that's a really really inspiring example of a business that um, is commercially successful, has a really important social impact aim, and has been able to uh, create a value proposition that's appealing to um, a regional uh, investment community. Um, another really interesting example uh is a, a a startup that we also have in the accelerator called right rack which is a comic book platform uh so that's more in the media space and what they're doing is essentially uh digitalizing uh comic books in myanmar for a um in an android or a mobile uh, mobile phone app where people can download it pay a little bit of money and get access to the library of comic books um that can be really really hard to access uh if 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 you're not you don't necessarily live in Yangon or another big city and don't have access to this kind of content. Uh, they've been able to monetize this and they've also been able to raise money from investors, um, both from Myanmar and, and, and from, from outside of Myanmar. So, you know, I, I think across the spectrum, um, you know, we, 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 we deeply feel that there's no, there's no sector where tech is not going to have an important impact. And that's certainly what we've seen with the startups that we've worked with over the last few years. Thanks, Robert. How how is that more in your um, your accelerator program and the, the enterprises that you've come across? Yeah. So um, as you um, in in Myanmar, uh, currently almost every sector is underdeveloped compared to to countries in the regions or more developed countries. Uh, These opportunities are almost everywhere, and um, entrepreneurs are solving many of these. Uh, issues and we focus with in terms of impact businesses mainly on the ones focusing on basic needs which uh, ranges from uh, energy to um, uh, food and egg businesses healthcare businesses or education businesses um, so companies that, that bring a uh, change to to these sectors uh, will have a big impact often on, on lives of, of the people of Myanmar um, so in in um, uh, in the past year we've worked with companies building micro grids uh, and working together with microfinance institutions in that uh, so they can uh, in, in a way to to spread their products um, uh, across rural areas. Uh, we've worked with agricultural value chain 
operators. So for example, solar dryers or coolers, um, for example, such as uh, Natural Farm Fresh here in Myanmar, um, who have a, uh, a big impact and are professionalizing the, the, the value chain um, um, rather quick with, with one substantial intervention. Um, private uh, affordable education services uh, that, that we work with as well and food testing services. Um, and in that sense, I think the, the educational or sorry, the, the agricultural companies are often interesting um, because the impact on the farmers, uh, on the income generation of the farmers can be very substantial. Um, and at the same time, the business models that they are used, be it from drying to uh, cooling and, and storage, um, transportation links or, or other processing links, are often done by very scalable um, uh, models in which the cases become relatively easily investable. Um, so, um, um, yeah, those are the main examples of companies that we've worked with. Thanks. Um... So both of you have spoken of how, how important it is that we have these entrepreneurial leaders and you're both very involved in, in building a larger pool of, of entrepreneurs and a stronger pool of, of, of enterprises, of tech ventures and social enterprises. So how, how exactly are you doing that and how are others contributing? Like how, what is that sort of spectrum or um, yeah, building pipeline spectrum looking at the moment and what might be potential gaps in building pipeline. Robert Willer, do you want to continue? Um, yes, uh, thanks uh, Emily. Um, I ver we very strongly believe that every player that is active in the, um, in the economic development and social development of, of Myanmar ranging from uh, specific types of NGOs, um, uh, donor organizations, incubators, accelerators, investors, from banks to international, local banks to international uh, angel investors, uh, multinationals and other trade channels. All of these organizations um, uh, become stronger when the different players are linked to each other. So uh, NGOs have often a further reach uh, locally and can flag um, uh, entrepreneurs early who then can go through uh, an incubator program or an accelerator program uh, who can then be linked to investors and find a market at multinationals that, uh, that are sourcing locally or can uh, sell to export markets. If entrepreneurs follow uh, these channels, this has a big benefit for all the individual players uh, and of course the, the, the biggest benefit for the entrepreneur, him or herself. Um, so I think uh, if you look at, uh, I think that every organization, including uh, our own, um, need to look very carefully where are you in the in that ecosystem um, and how are you linked to the uh, other organizations. Um, even though collaboration has here benefits for all the organizations, uh, sometimes it's easier to just focus on sort of your own island that you are working on. Um, uh, sometimes you have uh, your, your KPIs that you have as an organization even push you a bit away from the, from the collaboration. Um, but I think this is essential um, uh, to in, in developing a good SME support system that these parties start working together. Jess, how, how do you see that? Well, I think um, when you're working with, with early stage uh, companies uh, and startups, um, building up pipeline really means building up people and, and skills. Um, and that's, that's certainly a big part of what we're focusing on, right? We talked about this, this funnel of this entrepreneurial journey before. And for us, that very much starts with, it starts with the inspiration, right? Expanding the pool of people see that here's an opportunity um, to make a difference with whatever skills you have and, and whatever gaps you've seen in a certain market or in a certain sector. Um, and, um, you know, although there is a, an, an entrepreneurial uh, culture in Myanmar and a, and, a, and, a, and a business culture in Myanmar, the, um, 
the, the idea of how a, a startup works, and certainly when we think about tech startups, how they work, is still new to a lot of young people. So for us, it's really about bringing in good examples, both from the local market, but also from the, around the region and around the world, really, around how are, how are really impactful, uh, successful startups built, um, and how do, you, how do you take a basic idea and turn it into, into, into a business? Um, and start with that, and then, and then sort of pile on the skills that are necessary, whether that's tech skills, coding skills, and everyone these coding classes, or specific entrepreneurial skills, how do you build, how do you do customer development, how do you do sales and marketing, how do you build your team, and so on and so forth. We run this Founder Institute course that, that does that, um, up to a level where people are ready to, people might not have all the skills that are required, it might not have all the experience that that's uh, that, that's that's necessary, but are, are somewhat ready to um, to take the business off the ground. Um, so that's a very big part of, of building up the pipeline. Um, what's also really important is to uh, involve multiple stakeholders, right? I, I think you know organizations like ours uh, are in this every day, but uh, but but we we can't do all the work, right? We look at universities, um, corporates, um, the government, uh, and of course the investor community. Um, to also support the, the pipeline of entrepreneurs in, in, in Myanmar. And, you know, in, in, in many other countries that might be more developed, we've seen how governments have been very uh, proactive around supporting entrepreneurship and supporting um, the startup ecosystem. Um, we're, we're not there yet in Myanmar where we, where we can rely on the government to, to provide extensive support um, to these kind of companies. And, and, and that's okay. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll get there someday. And so, uh, for now, I think the corporates in Myanmar have an important role to play um, in, in terms of um, in terms of nurturing the the startup ecosystem and in terms of working directly with entrepreneurs who have developed um, applicable solutions that corporates can help take to take to market and and, and give exposure. Um, so we're focused on building out these relationships and bringing in strategic partners uh, in ways that uh, that support the entrepreneurs uh, directly. Thanks. So in, in, in the webinar now, we have people that are in Myanmar. We also have a lot of people that are, that are based in the region working for various types of um, organizations related to social impact. Why, why would you encourage people um, either in Myanmar, but especially also overseas to, to invest or otherwise support um, tech ventures and social enterprises in Myanmar? At this moment in time, what what is really the value proposition, and what are what are expectations? What are ways in which risk can be mitigated? Um, um, yeah, I think um, I, I think there I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in, in Myanmar right now. I think it's it's really important to recognize that. Um, that it's 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 a uh, it's it's a long game, um, and um, you know overnight success is 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 is, uh, is, is very rare anywhere, and, and it certainly is in Myanmar. Right? Um, Myanmar is probably five to seven years behind some of the other countries in the region, say Vietnam and Indonesia, in terms of the development of the overall ecosystem. Uh, but that also means that for patient capital, um, now is a really good time to get involved. Because if you start looking at some of the investment opportunities that are in Myanmar right now and that we'll see over the next year or two, um, there are not a lot of others uh, looking at that. And, um, and that's a really good opportunity to, uh, to work closely with some of the most promising entrepreneurs and get to know them um, at a stage where they may not need a high amount of investment, uh, where the valuations are low. Um, and certainly lower than in, uh, in, in some of the other countries uh, around the region, and where you get an opportunity as an investor to um, to get really close to some of these businesses and work with them um, on a on a long term on a long term basis. Um, there there are of course also also risks in in, in in Myanmar, right? Because of the early stage and the nascency of, of the ecosystem, and uh, that's also why we recommend anybody who, who looks at at the market here to um, Get in early, get in at, at, at low ticket sizes, but then diversify. Uh, use that focus to diversify and work with a number of promising entrepreneurs um, in order to get more deeply involved and get a better understanding of the market um, and, uh, and, and, and spread out your risk. Um, and so um, 
you know, it, it is it is really important to recognize, I think, that, that, that Myanmar is, is, is still at an early stage. Uh, but for the right type of investors, uh, that might actually be um, a benefit and not a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, Robert? Yes, um, uh, I firmly agree with, with Jess. Um, currently, the investment space, especially from, from international investors, is not growing as fast as the demand from entrepreneurs and that you see on the ground. Um, in terms of investment opportunities, um, this is very a, a beneficial situation for investors. Um, at least at this point, if you um, if you look at Myanmar, it's a very uh, relationship-based, trust-based economy, and will most likely stay like that in in the coming years. So um, yeah, like like just mentioned, uh, also. Um, a smart strategy, in, in our opinion, is if you can step in now, you learn about uh, Myanmar, like in a relatively small ticket size that you think very st strategically about, um, how do you see your long-term uh, involvement with Myanmar, your long-term investment strategy? Um, you think of small uh, entrances via certain entrepreneurs in strategic um, uh, places in, in value change, you step in, you work with them, uh, this will cost effort um, in, in the beginning, uh, but once you are present, um, you can learn about the country, people will learn about you, and once Myanmar will eventually, um, almost certainly at some point start developing, you find yourself in a very uh, strong position um, because people trust you already, you know better how to just how to uh, judge opportunities that might pop up at the time. Um, so I think coming in now can be an, uh, an, a relatively easy and, and affordable way um, to start a long-term strategy that is for, for obvious reasons, looking at the, where the economy stands now, that can be very uh, lucrative in the long run. Yep. So there are opportunities, but um, um, only, I think, if you look at it from a long-term perspective. There's no quick gains, like mentioned by, by Jess as well, um, but in the long term, in almost every single sector, there are tremendous opportunities. And I, I think maybe maybe it, it might be helpful for some of the listeners that if, if we sort of try and um, give some examples of what that what, what a fundraising journey could look like for, for some of the companies that we that we work with, right? So, what we've seen um, at, at Pandiar is that when we when we accept companies into the accelerator, they're typically at the pre-revenue stage, um, and we uh, we invest uh, twenty-five thousand dollars in each startup at a, at a two around two hundred thousand dollar valuation. Um, the typical next round after that, which is a, which is an investment we see a lot of. In, in Myanmar um, is um, is a roughly hundred thousand dollar round um, at a five to seven hundred thousand dollar valuation, and that will be at a stage where the company is uh, certainly not profitable yet. Probably won't be profitable for, for several years, but has revenue, has customers, and has traction and so on. Um, the next round after that would then typically be a a, a two hundred to to four hundred thousand dollar round. Um, at a at a one to one point five million dollar valuation, um, we still don't see a lot of rounds like that. But certainly among the startups that have done uh, that have done well in the first one to two years, uh, sometimes longer uh, since launch, um, we still need some fuel to grow um, and have numbers to to support that growth. Um, that's 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 typically typically the, the trajectory. Uh, and beyond that, um, we see we, we have some investments, but but still very few, and so it's it's hard to 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 attach that to a certain trend. But typically, we see sort of a twenty-five thousand dollars seed, a pre-seed round, hundred thousand dollar follow-on round, and the next one would be maybe we could call it the Myanmar Series A, which would be let's say four hundred thousand dollars at a one to one point five million dollar valuation. I don't know if Robert, if that's a similar trend you see with your company. Yeah, but the, the strategy we, um, uh, the investment strategy that we follow is uh, very much consistent of the second and the third stage that you, um, uh, Pandiar, uh, do. So we, are, the investment sizes in which we enter the company are usually between 100,000 and around 700,000 US, uh, US dollar. 
Um, that is for a seven-year investment horizon. Uh, also in companies that are already proven uh, in the market, uh, have already re uh, solid revenue. Um, usually with the investment, they, they might not be profitable in the first years, but have good uh, revenue uh, and good cash flow prospects. Um, and then after two to three years, if it goes according to the investment plan, and the company develops well, we do a follow-up investment of between one and three million. Um, what is important to, um, uh, to see is that, because it might be hard in a, in a country like Myanmar to find uh, the, the right exits, um, so you try to work with sort of self-liquidating models. So um, we often use royalties on uh, EBITDA, um, or on sometimes on, on based on revenue, in which the entrepreneur already um, pays off uh, um, part of the um, part of the investment uh, as a predetermined scheme, uh, which means that after five to seven years, the um, uh, the exit can be easier done because a, a lower share of the um, uh, of the company is still in the hands of the investor. Uh, and it, uh, since the company has most likely um, uh, been growing um, uh, over the over the time, um, that that makes the exits a lot easier. Hmm. And beyond beyond investors um, only, are there also other type of types of organizations of, of funds uh, programs that you hope would um, yeah support start work in in Myanmar? I think uh, if I start on, on, on this one, um, yeah, I think the, um, the, um, the, the relation between uh, inve sort of private investors or, or even um, investments done by, by foundations um, and other kinds of, for example, uh, grant financing or de-risking of investments, I think it's very important that those two work closely together. So for example, um, uh, grant financing that lays the foundation that builds um, structures within uh, the agricultural sector, right? the, the cooperatives or other structures that then um, um, entrepreneurs arise out of that, uh, or certain um, innovations that are being, that are very risky and that are being brought um, uh, by certain organizations that are being brought to Myanmar and then investments can be used to scale uh, to scale up these innovations once they are proven in one of two uh, projects. I think um, it, that is not easy and needs a very um, critical look, but if done right, I think that's a very good recipe for different organizations to work together and create uh, impact and innovation together. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Robert. I think grant money can be, um, can be, can be really valuable. Um, but, but I think it's, it's important that it's being used to augment um, augment equity investments. Uh, we see sometimes that we have uh, promising uh, companies um, that have managed to attract a bunch of grant funding, but once that dries up and they sort of haven't structured themselves to get ready for uh, for, for venture capital or any type of, of, of equity investment or debt investments for that matter, um, they get in trouble. And so I think it's really important that from early on, they get used to a reality where they have um, where they have equity investors on board. And I actually also think it's important that we expect from entrepreneurs to have a little bit of risk themselves. Um, you, you know, it may not be in the form of investing a lot of money in their own business. Um, and I think it's important that we don't create a, a barrier for entry in this ecosystem where you have to be well off to start a startup. Um, but, but, but that this, the entrepreneurs take some sort of risk um, to, 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 to create a sense of urgency around the growth of their, uh, of their company. So, so that's something we, we always try to, try to encourage. Mm, yeah. Um, so if, if you would want to share a few sort of final takeaways about um, building pipeline in Myanmar and investing in Myanmar, what, what are some key points you would want to leave the audience with? before we move into questions. Um, yeah, so if I start with this, I, um, I would like to give one uh, final, uh, final takeaway. 
um, which is that there are many opportunities in Myanmar. Um, they are in any value chain, um, but it, it, I think it's only or almost only possible to capitalize on those if you take a very realistic and long-term approach. Um, there's no quick wins, as you saw uh, uh, some of the wave of companies that came in after Myanmar opened up. Um, they uh, they came in and they, they thought it was uh, it was the new uh, uh, paradise for for businesses and everything could, could grow. Um, that is not the reality. It was not the reality back then, and it's still not the reality um, uh, today. Um, so I think if you enter the market, be prepared, and you see almost every company that is long-term engaged um, with Myanmar, uh, you see that they are going a bit beyond uh, their actual core business, um, take in their core business a long-term strategy, and around that, um, uh, uh, create your own pipeline, create your own uh, support system. You see that all kinds of investors are also giving support to entrepreneurs, either pre or post investments or creating linkages uh, uh, for them. You see that multinationals might work with um, with entrepreneurs to, to make their supply more consistent or higher, um, better consistency and higher quality. I think these kind of things, when you enter Myanmar, you have to take into, into account that you will have to do that most likely. Uh, but if you do it and if you take a long-term strategy, there's opportunities in almost every single uh, sector um, in Myanmar. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Just. I think the the, the, the number one uh, takeaway that, that I would share with the listeners is that um, most people in Myanmar have access to the internet now. Um, four years ago, that wasn't so. Um, also, what most people in Myanmar do with that internet access is they go on Facebook and nothing else. <laughs> hmm. And uh, that's not going to stay that way. Uh, and uh, whoever whoever figures out. Uh, whoever cracks the code in terms of developing and, and, and providing the digital products and services that people will use widely um, to, to make payments, uh, to communicate, to conduct business, to sell and buy stuff online, to learn, to get access to healthcare, whoever cracks the code on, in, in, in those and many other areas um, will do really, really well. And like Robert said, and we're, like we talked about earlier today, that's going to take some time. Um, but I also think it's a, it's a really exciting, exciting opportunity. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you're, you're of course committed to Myanmar, um, as is AVPN. And I think we also hope that through our members and then through members that are already actively working on, um, the social enterprise and the impact space in Myanmar, um, yeah, we can facilitate. Uh, the work of potential other people operating in Myanmar in the future. So in that sense, we hope this was helpful for, for some of the listeners. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'll try and uh, cluster them a little bit. Some of the questions are more related to um, entrepreneurs, their backgrounds, etc. Others more to the investment journey, ticket sizes. Um, but so maybe to start with some of the questions on... Um, on the entrepreneurs, there's a question about the demographic of entrepreneurs. Like, what, 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 what sort of people are they at the moment? Um, yeah, whoever wants to start. Um, well, I can I can start with that. Um, so, so we have when we started the accelerator at Pandiar back in 2016. Um, I think we had a hypothesis that um, we'd get a lot of uh, applications from. Uh, from repats, i.e. Uh, Myanmar people who had studied or worked overseas in Singapore or in the uh, US, Australia or anywhere else, um, coming back to Myanmar. Um, and um, and we, we do have a, a, a quite a bit of that. But in fact, many of the really interesting um, entrepreneurs that we see here are folks, uh, folks that have grown up and lived all or most of their lives uh, in Myanmar. Uh, <clears throat> something we see quite a bit is that those people who, who, who have been here um, as we've gone through this uh, pretty radical change in Myanmar since uh, 2012, essentially, um, are some of the ones that have the best understanding of, of, of the consumer mentality here um, and, uh, and, uh, and of the mindset of, of, of Myanmar people. And that's obviously really, really valuable when you're, when you're providing um, 
services and, and products to, to that population. Um, some of the best teams we see are the ones that have a combination of those two types of demographics, right? So um, people who have lived and worked overseas and who have acquired valuable experience, perhaps working with international companies and maybe starting startups elsewhere, uh, coupled with those founders who uh, have lived and worked here for most of their lives and have a, a deeply ingrained understanding of the, of, 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 of the consumer mentality here. Um, yeah, from my side, um, uh, we see um, a large amount of, of, of women entrepreneurs, uh, female entrepreneurs. Um, if we look at the people that come to our, uh, our accelerator that approach us, um, I would say that almost half of them are female entrepreneurs and in our programs, usually more than half. Uh, of them. Um, often, I would say in, in terms of age, they are uh, often between 20 and, and 40, I would say, although sometimes um, uh, they can be uh, much older than that. Um, and we see often two types of entrepreneurs. Uh, one is a sort of spin-off of a family business, so the new generation takes over and wants to uh, either radically change the, the way they do business or, or, or start scaling up an, an old business, or it's a, a grassroots sort of initiative uh, that's very much linked to the background of, um, um, of an entrepreneur. Often it started in the village where the entrepreneur came from, um, for example. Okay. We, we have another question on your activities. Um, does Bandiar or Rockstart also implement uh, activities outside of Yangon? Well, um, I, I can start with that one too. So, um, one complaint that we get at Pandir sometimes is that we are a little bit too Yangon centric. <laughs> um, and I actually think it's true. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're based in downtown Yangon, we have this big space down here, and, and, and that's all great. But um, most of the people we see here are also from Yangon. Now, it's been really good to see over the last few years that we have. You know, there's, there's a thriving tech community in Mandalay. Some of the folks in our accelerator are coming up from Mandalay to stay in Yangon and join the program and so on, and that's really good. Um, what we've been wanting to do for a while is to go a little bit beyond the big cities in Myanmar and go to some of the smaller communities um, and, and, and look at uh, where might there be pockets of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation um, where, we can, uh, where we can provide some value. And so for that reason, we've actually, uh, just now, we launched them. Um, we launched an innovation bus, Pandy are on wheels, basically, that will take around the country uh, to do events, uh, startup challenge events, uh, entrepreneurship meetups, tech events, skills building courses, and all these kinds of things um, to get some more, some more folks from all over Myanmar engaged, uh, not just with our activities, but also just make sure that they have an avenue through which to become part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Myanmar and get access to some of the resources that the folks in Yangon and Mendeley have. Um, yes, from, uh, from, from our side, um, um, firstly, uh, so the main accelerator program takes place in Yangon. Um, the, most of the organizations that are participating, most of their activities are uh, far, far away from Yangon in Sagaing or in Shen, um, Shen State, but then often the entrepreneur has access or lives in, in Yangon, him or herself. Um, we are organizing workshops uh, and trainings in places like Tangji, Mendeley, uh, and we are in the process of scaling those up as well. Um, the most important thing there is that um, it won't be short courses, um, but that there is a very clear follow-up on how you can go to, well, either the still city hubs or even more uh, remote places, but still have a follow-up of trainings uh, that can lead, that, that can make the entrepreneurs investment ready, then be linked to invest and the investment can be managed. So um, we are um, currently considering setting up uh, small satellite offices um, that can provide consistent support um, over the course of the entire year and at some point also as a an extended arm can manage investment in these in these areas, but that's still a, a work in, in progress. Yeah, well, this this relates to another question someone asked: um, how how do you find the entrepreneurs that you work with, or how do they find you? Um, anything else that you would want to say to that, or or Jess? 
Well, um, community building is a, is, a, is a big part of, of what we do here. Um, and uh, for that reason, we have, a, we have a dedicated community manager on our team um, who is responsible for um, setting up events, uh, creating partnerships with universities and others um, to provide exposure to, to, to the people who, who, who may be ready to sort of be part of our pipeline right now or who is not ready right now, but who may be ready a year or two down the line. Um, so uh, basically every week we'll have one to two public events here at Candiar. Sometimes we go to universities, uh, host events there. Sometimes we collaborate with, with corporates to do events there. Um, uh, and, and this is all very low commitment stuff. This is really just come and join a meetup for two hours or uh, join a presentation with an interesting entrepreneur from uh, from 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 Indonesia or whatnot who comes to Myanmar to present their work. Um, so again, this inspiration stage where um, which is really all about expanding the community. Um, so that's that that's that's really <clears throat> that's really a big part of the pipeline. Uh, in addition to that, you know, word of mouth is very very powerful here, of course, and a lot of people who come to Pendyar to talk about their businesses, who we somehow end up working with. As they know someone who's already been part of the program, so who have just been to some of Handyar's events in the past. Yeah, um, for us, uh, uh, very much in line with what just uh, just said. Um, to get in touch initially uh, with entrepreneurs, there's not really any shortcut. Just any kind of organization, uh, any kind of company or entrepreneurs that you already know, or even that you read in in in, in a newspaper or that. You did, um, Kind of organizations are working with um, you uh, via them you get in touch with the entrepreneurs and, and meet with them uh, and then organize events um, um, uh, for those which are very very easy to to access to and then when we meet entrepreneurs we uh, aim to have something either organized by us or by somebody else for any kind of entrepreneur that we have um, and so we ourselves are organizing several kinds of free accelerator programs uh, that entrepreneurs can can follow, um, and those build the relationship with the entrepreneur, but also build the pipeline of entrepreneurs. And the most eager ones of these programs can then join in the in the main accelerator, and these can then um, uh, uh, join or be invested in by either by ourselves or by other investors um, in Myanmar. So there's no shortcut. Use every channel to to find entrepreneurs and have events and uh, training programs to, to build the own, your own pipeline. Okay. Um, Robert, we have a very specific question for you and also for the attendant who asked this question. We can, we can link later on and, and, and help find out more about this. But there's a question about whether you've worked with any social enterprise working on clean water supply. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've worked with um, with one specifically um, that was in that sense in in Yangon. Uh, it was a pretty sort of uh, uh, straightforward uh, company. Uh, in this case, they, they have a water pump um, and then uh, treat uh, treat the water um, and then sell it in usually the uh, the recycle. Uh, uh, you say the recycled uh, twenty liter bottles. Uh, we sell most others to, to the airport and uh, Yangon and other places in the in the area. Um, also in, um, in in Nepal we worked with and invested in um, in water uh, water drinking water related uh, sources. Um, and we have a few more on the radar. So yeah it's interesting to to, to be connected to that if, if somebody's interested in it. Then we have a cluster of questions around um yeah, the investment journey, um, ticket sizes, etc. One of these questions um, is whether the investment opportunity in Myanmar is more startup, or if there are also established social businesses to consider. Um, yeah, if I if I take this, um, well, I think the. Um, in order to find uh, the right companies, they are not um, sort of up for, for, for grabs in a way. So, um, and also it depends a bit on the term of social business. Like um, often if we look uh, beyond sort of very early stage um, startups, we, um, we classify as impact businesses as people who work in, in, in basic 
um, in uh, supplying basic needs and use a substantial new technology and a, and a sort of better, they pay higher prices or um, uh, deliver much higher quality of indeed drinking water or other uh, agricultural uh, products, um, have better drying, uh, drying technologies, for example, in, in case of natural farm fresh. As I, as I mentioned before, food testing services uh, of one of our companies. Um, so I think if you really look at social enterprises in terms of almost sort of with um, missions that would be suitable within, uh, within certain NGOs uh, as well, um, those are usually really small and also I think quite difficult to, 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 be, to invest in as a, as a private investor. If you make the term um, social enterprise slightly broader into, for example, a term used for that is inclusive business uh, recently more and more, there are quite some, some opportunities there in EMR and also the, um, um, the supply of these kind of businesses, the presence of these businesses is also growing currently, but, it, but from a low base. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that there's, I think that there's you know, if you're a venture investor, you'll you'll find venture investment opportunities here. If you're more SME focused, you, you, you'll certainly also find a, a lot of good opportunities there. Um, we're we're a venture at Pandia, right? Which means that we're looking for we're looking for some of the tech businesses that are going to be that are going to be really big in the future. And um, in order to do so, uh, we know that we need to support a large number of promising businesses. Many of them, uh, most of them, w w will not will not get that big and, 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 and many of them who may not succeed or will be able to do something. Yeah. So um, we, we are building up the, the, the ecosystem and some of the ones that don't make it first time around are hopefully going to go on to do other interesting things or start new businesses later on that will, that will become successful. Um, and so I don't think it's necessarily binary like that. And I think you can, um, you can do one uh, while still supporting a broader ecosystem of, of entrepreneurs generally. So we, have, we had a couple of questions also around um, ticket sizes, um, valuations, et cetera. Most of those were asked before, just you gave a bit of a breakdown of, um, yeah, sort of, typical rounds of investment in Myanmar. So if, for the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll skip those for now. But if, if attendants who had such questions uh, would like to find out more, um, yeah, please, please do get in touch afterwards. Um, another question is um, whether there are enough accelerators, incubators in Myanmar um, and what type of role they're playing in building the ecosystem. Um, I think the short answer to that is is, is no. <laughs> I mean, the, we, we, the, the ecosystem is small in terms of the number of entrepreneurs and startups there are, uh, but it's also small in terms of the number of ecosystem builders that are available, and maybe, maybe those two go hand in hand. Um, but, 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 but I mean, the, the, the number of, of organizations that are supporting, um, that are supporting startups and, 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 and new ventures is, is still small. Uh, and I think it's really important, not just that there are accelerators and incubators, but also all, all types of, of ecosystem builders, um, of course, investors as well, um, places to go to learn skills, uh, mentoring um, and resources that are available, tech companies that are supporting uh, new startups and new tech businesses and so on. Um, and so the more savvy entrepreneurs, um, you know, they use what's available in, in Myanmar. They come to us, they come to, 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 to want to watch and so on. And then they also go, um, go overseas to get in touch directly with, with folks who might be able to support them from, from where, wherever they are. But you know, we'd love to see more, 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 more people and more organizations in the, uh, in the ecosystem building space here in Myanmar, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that as well. I think uh, one of the reasons for that is that um, the, the Myanmar companies, most of them, apart from the maybe 1% uh, top entrepreneurs, uh, uh, all the other ones, they need a lot of work, a lot of support on uh, working with them. So I think there's definitely uh, a need of um, organizations that 
do not just only provide a certain almost like a, a microphone or a stage for um, for entrepreneurs, but that really sit next to the entrepreneur, uh, work with the entrepreneur or support in the development of the business model, testing the assumptions that it's built on, sharing um, uh, different kind of strategies that they could use um, to grow and develop, educating them about how to to, to uh, connect to investors, how to present your business uh, to investors, and what you should watch for and when you should go for certain uh, type of, uh, of investments and at what moment. I think all of that work, um, there's very limited availability of that in, in Myanmar. And I think definitely uh, there's a, a very large um, a group of entrepreneurs that would benefit from that. And these entrepreneurs would play. I actually got cut out for a second, but I think I'm back. Um, Robert, you're still there, right? Yeah, we're still there. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions that I am afraid we won't have time to, to answer now. But um, again, if, if, if you would like to explore these questions further, then please email them to um, membership at avpion.asia um, and we can help facilitate connections. Um, yeah, so with that, I would like to thank everyone for participation in, in this session. Um, thank you to all the attendants and all the attendants who asked questions. And thank you, Robert and Jess, very, very much for sharing your experiences and your perspectives. Um, Thanks, Emily. I also yeah. wanted to mention the AVPN Myanmar Social Investment Forum that is coming up again next February. Uh, the date will be 26th February of 2019. This is the third time that AVPN will be organizing a social investment forum in Myanmar. Um, it's grown very rapidly in the last two years and we hope to see um, a lot of members from the region there this time again and yeah continue grow this ecosystem in Myanmar. So thank you everyone. We will post uh, the webinar on our website by next week so um, please look out for it there as well and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.